Have you ever been in a restaurant with a, a group of folks and the server comes to the table and says, can I take your drink order now? And someone says, I'll have a Coke. And the server says, is Pepsi okay? And the devoted Coke drinker gets a look of, of sort of disappointment and says, no, I'll, I'll just have water. And people at the table will then say, well, you know, Coke, Pepsi, isn't it just all the same thing? And the devoted Coke drinker will go, no, it's not the same thing. Coke and Pepsi are not at all alike. And the devoted Pepsi drinker will say the same thing, that if offered Coke, they want Pepsi. They, they will both say they may have cola in their name. They may share that, but they're not the same thing. And there are things that people think are the same, but maybe they're really not the same. For example, uh, wrestling. I mean, Olympic wrestling and the WWE, uh, they're both wrestling, Um, but they're not the same thing. In the Olympics, they don't allow uh, you to grab a folding chair and hit your opponent uh, over the head with it. That's not allowed in the the Olympics. Um, They're both wrestling, but... They're not the same thing. Now, I kind of mention that because sometimes people, especially on TV, uh, people you hear will will come and especially when they're people who are not very religious or people who are kind of outside of religion, and they'll they'll sound very philosophical and they'll sound very erudite and they'll go, well, aren't all religions basically the same? Isn't every religion just kind of the same thing? You just kind of change the names and the places and the dates. Uh, Someone said, you know, all religions are just kind of the same. It's like you're headed to the top of the mountain, and there's just different trails, and there are different paths to the top of the mountain, but you're all all headed to the same place. Aren't, Aren't all religions just the same? Well, that's kind of a big question. I've been looking at big questions, and I'll tell you up front, my answer is No. No, all religions are not the same. There are stark differences, big differences in religions. And and as a Christian and as a Christian pastor, a Christian minister, I I would say there's lots of differences among and between religions, especially lots of differences that make Christianity different, that make Christianity unique. And and so I want to talk a little bit about what makes Christianity unique today among other religions. And let's think about the world and think about religions in the world. Um, Do you know there's about approximately 7.7 billion people in the world? World population is right at 7.7 billion, which is kind of crazy when I think about it because I looked up what was the population of the world the year I was born. I was born in 1959, which, yes, do the math, I'll be 60 next month. Um, So I was born almost 60 years ago, in 1959. The population of the world in 1959 was under 3 million. It was almost 3 million. So it was like 2.9 something, I mean billion, I'm sorry, 2.9 something billion. Yeah, that would really be a change. Uh, (laughs) Population of the world 60 years ago was like 2.9 something billion. And now it's 7.7 billion. So the population of the world has more than doubled in my lifetime, from right at 3 billion to over 7.5 billion. That's a lot of folks in the world. And when you break them down by religion, it looks something like this. Um, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. Uh, There are approximately 2.4 billion Christians. Well, 2.4 2.4 billion people who self-identify as Christians. Although it's interesting, some people self-identify as Christians and they don't really, they don't go to church, they don't pray. Some people who identify as Christians don't even believe in God, which is kind of weird. Um, but 2.4 billion people self-identify as Christians, making Christianity the largest religion. Now, this is Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, non-denominational, you know, any and all people who would call themselves Christian, it's about 31% of the planet. So about three out of 10 people in the world would self-identify as Christians. Second largest religion is Islam. Muslims make up about 1.8 billion, which is about 23, almost a fourth of the world is Muslim. 
Uh, now, you might say non-religious is not really a religion, but I put it in there just so you'll know that there's about 1.2 billion people in the world who would say they have no religion. They would identify as an atheist, as an agnostic, or if asked the question, what is your religion, they would say, none. So about 1.2 billion folks would say they have no religion. A lot of those folks are in China. China, uh, the official state religion is atheism. Uh, A lot of those folks are also in communist countries, say like North Korea, places like that. Increasingly, sadly, uh, Western Europe has an increasing number of non-religious and and atheist folks, and increasingly in our culture, in the United States, the number of non-religious, atheist, or non-believing people continues to to rise dramatically. So there's about 1.2 billion people who would say they have no religion, and we'll put them there in the category too. Uh, Hinduism is about 1.2 billion, it's about 16%. Buddhism, about half a billion. And then there's a whole bunch of others, but I added Judaism in there just because it's of particular interest to us as Christians. There's a whole bunch between Buddhism and Judaism, a lot of uh, ancestor worship and, and a lot of other, Zoroastrianism and lots of other religions that are fairly small that we may not have even heard of. But way down about number 20 on the list is Judaism. And you notice Judaism is only 14 and a half million. Get the word right there. So, whereas Buddhism is half of a billion, go way down the list, and Judaism is about 14 and a half million, which is 0.2% of the world Jewish. So, that gives, that's a landscape of the the five major biggest religious groups, including non-religious, and then how that falls out in our population of 7.7 billion. And if you say, well, Aren't all those religions basically the same? Don't they all kind of have things in common? At least the four that are actually our religions. Um, well, you know, in a way, yes, all religions have some moral code of some kind. Uh, most religions would agree that murder is wrong and theft is wrong and lying is wrong. There's the moral code attached to just about every religion. Most religions have some kind of gathering place. Uh, Some place where people who follow that religion gather daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, periodically of some kind. Most religions have some kind of writings or book or scripture or or some sort of guidance from some kind of writing. So you'd say, well, those are all things that are common to all religions, and yeah, that's true. But but there's a lot of differences. And and as a, a Christian... I would like to point out, I think, three of the, the distinctives of Christianity that would make it different from other religions. The first thing that I would say makes us different from some of the other major religions is we as Christians believe that history is going somewhere. History is going somewhere. We believe that history had a beginning, history has a middle, and ultimately history will have a culmination. There will be an end, a culmination of history that will end with the kingdom of God. Now, that contrasts that with Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, And I put Hinduism and Buddhism together because Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism. They are intimately connected. Uh, The origins of Hinduism are are prehistory. Buddhism begins with the Buddha, Gautama Buddha, uh, who is born into a Hindu culture. And so the two together make up a huge part of our planet. Um, Buddhism is to to Hinduism in some ways as Christianity is to Judaism. Just as Christianity comes out of Judaism, Buddhism comes out of Hinduism. Now, the Hindu faith is primarily in India. Remember, India is a billion people. There's a billion people in India, and the vast majority of people in India are Hindu. Buddhism is found primarily in Asian countries, um, China, Japan, Vietnam, Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, all kinds of, all over Southeast Asia. And I'm lumping it all together. There are dozens and dozens of varieties of both Hinduism and Buddhism. Some worship a multitude of gods, sometimes thousands of gods. Some narrow it down to, to three gods. Some talk about one god. Some Hindu folks don't believe in any personal God at all. Um, But the thing that 
Hinduism and Buddhism all would share would be a conception of life that is circular. Circular. What I mean by that is the idea of reincarnation. In both Buddhism and Hinduism, the idea of you born, you're born, you live, you die, and then you're reincarnated and born again into a ne- the next life. And you live and you die and you're born again into the next life thousands of times. Not always as a human, sometimes as an animal. And this cycle, this circle of reincarnation goes on and on and over and over again. Um, life, death, rebirth. Life, death, rebirth. And also, they would say the universe is circular. That the universe is born, sticks around for about 8 billion years, the universe dies, and then the universe is reborn. And that happens over and over and over and over again, and it's circular. And in Hinduism, and in many cases in Buddhism as well, the point of life is to eventually someday get out of that circle, (laughs) to escape that circle of reincarnation. And if you can ever escape that cycle, that circle of reincarnation, to escape it is to find nirvana. And nirvana is getting off the wheel of reincarnation and finally being free of all desire, all want, and it says you're like a drop of water then falling back into the ocean. You lose all individuality, you lose all personality, and are sort of one with the cosmos. And so in Hinduism and Buddhism, there's a circle that continues over and over. Well, in in our faith and in Judaism and in Islam, life isn't a circle, it's a line. The Bible says there's a beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. And then from that beginning point, God makes us, makes people, makes us in His own image, and yet makes us with the ability to choose either to follow Him or not. And tragically, so many of us do not. We, we break His rules, we stray from His will, we sin. And because of that sin, the world is broken. And because of that brokenness, God historically has sent prophets and messengers to try to bring people back to him. He, he creates a, a nation of Israel and says, you're the kingdom of priests. You're to bless the whole world and spread the news about me. And they do a kind of a so-so job of that until one born into that family of Abraham, Jesus of Nazareth, comes in the fullness of God, God incarnate to show us the face of God, to show us the love of God, the heart of God, and then to lay down his life for the sins of humanity. His life is a sacrifice for our brokenness so that we need not fear death, so that we can find eternity, eternal life, and eventually live in God's eternal home. You see, in Christianity, the world is going somewhere. History's going somewhere. And I don't have thousands of lives. I've got, I got this life. I got one life. And this one life that I have made in the image of God as an eternal being with a soul, I get to make decisions in this life that will impact all of my eternity. And the way I interact with other people will impact their eternity as well. And when I die, Paul says that we have this thing called a spiritual body where I'm still me and you're still you and we're with the Father for all eternity. So we believe that history is not one ever never-ending circle, we believe history is going somewhere. The second thing that I would say is distinctive about our faith is grace. Grace. Now, if you know anything about some of the Eastern religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, you've probably heard the word karma. Karma is the idea that if I do something good in this life, I'll be rewarded in my next life. If I do something bad in this life, I'll be punished in the next life. And how I am born in the next life depends on what I do in this life. If I continue to do good deeds in this life, then in my next life I might be richer or more prosperous or healthier or have a bigger family or sort of move up. If I do bad things in this life, I might be born into a poorer family, an illness, an injury, a handicap, a 
an infirmity, or I might not even be born as a human at all. I might be born as a lower animal. And that reincarnation, that karma, either you go up or you go down. And if you're poor or handicapped or have lots of problems, you're, you're paying the price of something you did in the last life. It's karma. Now, think about that and think about the contrast of this little Christian nun, Mother Teresa. Some of you have read about and know about. Mother Teresa was a little Albanian nun who traveled to Calcutta, India to work with the poorest of the poor, the so-called untouchables, the people that would literally be on the streets dying of diseases and people would just step over them. Well, Mother Teresa would bring those untouchables, those poorest of the poor, into her place where her sisters of mercy would, would be ministering to them and, and giving them medicine and, and, uh, and healing or, you know, patching up their wounds and things like that. And, and the response this little nun, Mother Teresa, got from so many of the people in India was, why are you doing this? Those untouchables in the street, it's karma. They're lying there because they did something to deserve it in a previous life. Why would you get in the way of karma? These people who are suffering are suffering because of what they did in a previous incarnation. And they didn't understand Mother Teresa doing what she did. So we have a different understanding. We have this thing called grace. Now, let's think about the three great monotheistic religions of which we are one, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Jesus is born into Judaism. Jesus is born a Jew. Then, centuries after Jesus, Muhammad is born and proclaims himself the final prophet of Allah, of God, and says that the Arab people are also the descendants of Abraham, not through Isaac, the one son, but through Ishmael, the other son of the Egyptian mother. And the Quran proclaims that the people... The Muslim people are also children of Abraham. And so that's why Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all called Abrahamic faiths. Because they all trace back to Abraham. But both Judaism and Islam are missing this essential message of the cross and grace. Judaism rejects the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. Many Jews are still hoping and waiting for a Messiah. The Quran, the holy book of Islam, honors Jesus. Jesus is mentioned frequently in the Quran as a great prophet, but not as great as Muhammad. And so they are missing the identity of Jesus. When we visited Jerusalem, both when Jenny and I went there with the other pastor group and when we took the group from our church there uh, this, this spring, uh, one of the places you can visit in Jerusalem is the Upper Room. And this is the traditional place where the Last Supper took place. Like a lot of sites, are we absolutely sure this is the right spot? No, we're not absolutely sure this is the right spot. Um, but this is the traditional place that is presented as the Upper Room. And so pilgrims visit the Upper Room. And it's kind of a delicate balance because the, the building that it's housed in is actually has a Muslim owner. And you know it has a Muslim owner because there's a sign on the wall by the door. And it's in Arabic, um, but, and that's the best picture I could get of it. But the sign on the door of the upper room in Arabic, put up there by the owners of the building who are Muslim, says, God has no son. It says, God has no son. Because in Islam, the idea that Jesus is the son of God is blasphemy. So the sign is there to remember, to remind anyone who's there who can read Arabic that they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, the thing about both Islam and Judaism is there is no understanding of what happened on the cross. And salvation in both Islam and Judaism is pretty much dependent on do your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Um, And you just never know until you die what's going to happen to you. There's no assurance of salvation in those faiths. You just don't know where you might end up. You kind of have hope, but you you don't know. that In our faith, we know. 
We know because we're saved not by our deeds, but by God's grace. My salvation isn't based on how many good deeds I pile up. It's based on what Jesus did on that cross. 1 John 5.11 says this, And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Our salvation is not based on what we've done. It's based on what Jesus has done. And because of what Jesus has done, we can live with the knowledge that we... We are safe in the arms of God. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this, I'm convinced, says Paul, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. As Christians, we believe history is headed towards a culmination As Christians, we believe in the concept of grace through the cross. And finally, we believe in an empty tomb. We believe in an empty tomb. Sometimes when people are talking about Jesus, um, especially people who are maybe trying to be unbiased and, and on the news, Jesus is mentioned as one of the great men of history or great people of history. They'll say Plato and Aristotle and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and... Gandhi and Martin Luther King, and they'll kind of list Jesus as one among a a pantheon of great leaders and great people. Um, But there's something different about Jesus, and that's his grave is empty. You know, if you you go to Singapore, you can visit the Temple of the Tooth. Uh, Gautama Buddha was cremated at his death. But somebody saved one of his teeth. And there's an entire temple built around one of Buddha's teeth, the temple of the tooth. And you can go and worship there in, in Singapore at the temple of Buddha's tooth. If you go to Saudi Arabia, to the town of Medina, the birthplace of Muhammad, you can go to a mosque where Muhammad's body is buried the tomb of Muhammad. The Bible says that when Moses died, God himself buried him on Mount Nebo, on the other side of the Jordan River, on the east of the Jordan. So if you're in Israel and you're at the Jordan River and you look across the Jordan River into the country of Jordan, you can see Mount Nebo. It says no one ever knew where exactly Moses is buried, but Moses is buried on Mount Nebo in Jordan. But if you go to Jerusalem looking for Jesus' body, you won't find it. Jesus' corpse is not to be found. There's a church called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that's on a traditional site of the empty tomb. Um, Some of us went to a place called the Garden Tomb that may be another possible place where the empty tomb is located. We don't know for sure where that empty tomb is, but we know when the Romans had the, wanted to prove that Jesus was still alive, all they had to do was go parade his dead body through the streets, but they couldn't do that because it wasn't there. The tomb was empty, and Jesus was alive. We know that when the women went to anoint Jesus' dead body with oils and spices, they were met by angels who said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Now, my goal today is not to to disparage any other religion. Um, One of the, I think, great gifts that I have that I didn't really realize at the time was when I was, you know, that I was a teaching assistant, a philosophy teaching assistant, graduate assistant at OU for a couple of years. And when I was a teaching assistant at OU, I, I was with people of all different perspectives. I got to share an office with two Hindu grad students, uh, Malay Chakrabarti and Morali Ramachandran. And uh, <laughs> the three of us shared an office, and uh, both of them were Hindu. Uh, Malay was a traditional Hindu. Uh, Morali was, uh, was a Hindu atheist, but they were both Hindu. 
And uh, I learned a lot about Hinduism from, from Morali and Malay, and I, hopefully they learned some things from, about Christianity from me. Another grad student I went to school with was a grad student from Iran, uh, which Iran in the late 70s was an interesting place, but uh, he was a big friendly guy, he was a Muslim. I went to school with a lot of atheists. Uh, I took classes from a rabbi at the Hillel Foundation. Um, I have respect for other people and their faith. But only Christianity provides the way of salvation. Only Christianity is the way and the truth and the life. There, there is no one like Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You know, in the book of Acts, Peter and John are hauled before the Sanhedrin. They've healed the, the crippled man, the lame man. Peter has preached to a big crowd out in the temple courts. They're hauled in front of the Sanhedrin who says, who told you you could heal somebody? Who told you you could preach in the temple? Who gave you permission to do any of this? And Peter responds this way. He tells them about Jesus and says, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in no one else, says Peter. He is the Savior. His very name, Jesus, means the one who saves. Um, and our faith is unique in so many ways, even beyond the three I've mentioned. But our ministry and our mission is to share in a respectful and kind and loving way with everyone we meet who Jesus is and what He can do, what He has done in my life and what He can do in others' lives.